Okay, we're gonna try this again. Round two, Silverstone watched our first attempt at building a fanless system with stuff we had on hand and they, uh, they yeah, it was, wasn't very good. You're sick of seeing the same activation watermark with your shiny new rig, snag an OEM Windows 10 Pro key from SCD Key. Even if you've already installed Windows 10 on your machine, you can shell out a little over 10 bucks for an authentic key that'll activate your copy. Click the link below and use offer code SSTUDIO for an 18% discount on your order. So they sent us a bunch of stuff, actually more stuff than they had already sent us several months ago, to help us with our fanless PC endeavor. And I'm proud to say that we've totally shifted gears now, taking a lot of suggestions from you guys in the comments after watching our first attempt. We're switching the platform altogether. Uh, well, technically staying with the same platform, just switching our approach uh, with that platform. So this is a 2400G, and this means that we're not going to need a discrete GPU. That was our issue before, was getting a graphics card that wasn't meant to run passive to run passive, and uh, it ultimately didn't end up working. So what we're going to do is dump it all together. Now I could go with some passive 1050 Ti. I mentioned that in the other video. There are cards that are meant to run passive, uh, and maybe someday I'll get my hands on some of those. I'll have to buy them though, and I don't think they make them anymore. So I'll have to look for some on eBay or Amazon. I will get my hands on one very soon. Stay tuned for that. Uh, but for now, we're gonna create a passive system that will actually run and play some decent games in 1080p, maybe medium to low settings. Not expecting the world out of this 2400G, but it should still be, what is this? Uh, I don't even know what the TDP is here. Is there a TDP on the box? I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, four core, eight thread. It boosts to 3.9 gigahertz, and we do have Vega graphics integrated, so we should be able to cool it with a decent passive CPU cooler. Now, just using a cooler that's meant to have a fan running with it isn't gonna do the job. I don't think you guys were kind of cringing at that in the last video. So Silverstone said, yeah, we've got something for you. This brick right here, and it weighs, it's gotta weigh at least three pounds. It's freaking beefy, and it's a passive cooler. There aren't any fans that come with this cooler in the box. It just ships like this and you can mount fans to it. There are actually little brackets here. We can mount those little wire uh, frame things to, to get 120 mil fans on here. Maybe we'll do that in a separate video, what it would be like to run a passive cooler with fans. Maybe it'll be better than something like an NHD 15 from Noctua, but that's a separate video for a separate day. We're just gonna see if we can get a passive system actually working this time. And I think with the components we have on hand now, that will be uh, likely. A couple other things I want to point out. We are sticking again with our fanless Nightjar NJ450 power supply. A few of you were concerned about that. Some of you didn't even watch the entire video and you're like, oh, what about power supply? Well, I, the power supply is fanless. If you'd watched the video, you'd have known that. Thanks to those who did watch the video in its entirety, or at least for the most part. You kind of skip around, but I mean, this was like, this was the forefront of the build here. I mean, the power supply is one of those things that people tend to overlook when they're trying to build quiet systems, and some power supplies do get fairly loud. I have a couple of EVGA G3 power supplies that get extremely loud, even when they're not working very hard. And uh, so finding a fanless unit like this that's rated at 80 plus platinum is difficult. And uh, I'm really glad that Silverstone makes this. Uh, the other thing they sent, they sent two, two extra things. We have an SFX to ATX power um, supply adapter. You guys didn't see this in the last video, but because this is an SFX L power supply, we were just kind of letting it sit there inside an ATX cutout. It was connected to the chassis via one screw. This bracket will allow us to mount it properly. So nice of them to send that. Also the cabling, I had to use extensions because the cables in this power supply are not very long because it's meant to be used in small, small compact cases. Uh, these are extensions and uh, they're, well, they're not even extensions, they're actually it's a full cable set and you plug this directly into the modular power supply on one side and then your components on the other. The cables are just longer, so we won't have that issue either. So thanks to Silverstone for making this much more possible. Again, I think it's very likely we'll get a system up and running that will be totally fanless and self-sustaining. So let's go ahead and start building. Now, another Silverstone goodie is the FT-05 from Silverstone. This is supposed to be a great case for passive builds. So it's gonna allow heat to passively rise to atmosphere. A lot of cases have kind of a restricted top panel or maybe the layout's just not optimal for that kind of thing. Uh, so we're gonna use this case. I have no idea what the internals look like. I just know that Silverstone said it it would be a good case, so what the heck, why not? So in a nutshell, what you have here is a mid-sized tower that is turned sideways. You have intake fans that are actually placed on the bottom here, and these look huge. I think these are, 
either 180 mil or 200 mil fans. They're much larger than conventional 120, 140. Uh, and then those are supposed to pull in air from the base. There's about an inch worth of clearance down here. There's also sound damping material on the base as well as the left and right panels. That cold air gets pulled in from the bottom and it moves through the components, through the graphics card and the CPU, and heat exits up top. And this up here is just a little plastic grill. There's really no dust filter integrated up top. Although if it's a passive system, I wouldn't be as concerned about dust. So yeah, we're gonna take out this hard drive bay. We don't need that. We're using an M.2 SSD. Uh, and I think we're gonna take the fans out so that we have unhindered passive air being pulled in from the bottom as warm air exits the case from the top when our CPU gets hot. That's what I think's I think that'll be optimal. We'll find out. I mean, worst case, we gotta keep the two fans in here and we just turn them really low and we do sound tests anyway. But for a totally fanless system, I wanna have these removed and uh, we'll just see how it goes. Now, my decision to go with this particular motherboard, it's fairly simple. It's a B450 board. It's one of the only ones I have that's not currently occupying another system. And we get native APU support, so I don't have to update the BIOS. We could, in theory, do this with a B350 board, but we would have to update the BIOS and ensure that the motherboard had an HDMI or display port out. Let's pop this up. Double check for no bent pins, just to be on the safe side. Drop her in. All right, now we're at the bottom of the case. You can see there's this magnetic dust filter here and these fairly large fans. We're going to remove those. And I think because we're not gonna have any active cooling down here, I think I'm gonna leave the dust filter off as well. I wouldn't be too worried about dust in a fanless system, although I'm sure it would become an issue at a much later date. Good thing about a fan like this, because it is large, it's gotta be 180 mil, 200 mil, somewhere in that range, uh, is that you have silent operation, you can displace the same amount of air at a much lower RPM because these fan blades are so freaking huge. So worst case, the system gets too hot without fans in it. We just push these two back into the uh, to the bottom little bracket here in the case and, and you can have these fans pull in cool air from down below at a very low RPM. So if it's not fanless and if it's not totally quiet, we can get really close with these that are included in the case. You know, the only sound that this PC makes is when I power it on. The little button makes a little spring noise and that's it. Everything else is dead silent in here. There's no um, inductor, coil whining, anything like that. Uh, the power supply, of course, is dead silent. CPU cooler is getting pretty hot. I'm waiting for this to soak. And once it soaks, then uh, we'll see how quickly it can passively um, dissipate heat and uh, also see if our setup here is effective enough, right? Pulling cold air in from the bottom and allowing it to naturally rise. We'll see if that's effective. Uh, also, we're not stressing the graphics or the, the GPU, the integrated GPU uh, at this point, just stressing the CPU. Of course, the side panel's off. I'll go ahead and put that on in a second. But uh, CPU temps at the diode are 46 degrees Celsius. So that's about the temperature of this cooler and that feels about right. So yeah. Um, Let's just keep pushing it. Uh, we're gonna try to, to stress literally everything in the system, and then we'll throw a few games at it, like CSGO, run an Ashes of a Singularity benchmark, and see if the system is stable and makes it through those runs. All right, so you can see now it's been about an hour, and 70 degrees Celsius is pretty much where these things are topping out. Um, is there a lot of heat coming from this? Yeah, there's some heat. Uh, you can feel it just kind of passively uh, rise, and of course, down below, we would expect to have cold air being pulled in passively. So look, it's not gonna be, you know, as effective as a fan, obviously, but at least there is some rotation and circulation of air. And uh, that is why I believe our temps have leveled off here, even though our CPU cooler is heat soaked, there's enough circulation in there to get rid of enough heat to keep temps from 
rising even more, which I imagine they would do if we did something crazy like remove the CPU cooler entirely. So with that, we're gonna run some gaming benchmarks and then we're gonna try to bump the frequencies just a bit more and see how much more thermal headroom we have to play with. All right, so you can see we're in CSGO now, about 60 degrees Celsius at the GPU. I've been playing for about 10 minutes and that temperature has not really pegged above 60 C. Not sure why it's saying we're using 65,000% of, uh, of our software. I wasn't paying attention, GG, got killed by a bot. 960 megahertz or so for the GPU is pretty low significantly lower than stock for the CPU, the 2300 megahertz across all four cores. It's uh, yeah, not that great. That's why our frame rate is around 100 FPS. A lot of times though, it'll jump above 100, especially when I'm showing my own gameplay and not someone else's. Uh, but yeah, this isn't super great for CSGO. Part of the reason why is because we've underclocked both our GPU and CPU. So what I'm gonna do now, now that we know we have plenty of temp headroom, uh, is clock these two up to, I'm gonna try three gigahertz for the CPU and then maybe 1100 for the GPU. We'll see how that fares. So we're at 3.2 gigahertz all core. That's not bad for a passive system. It could be better. And if I really just took my time and troubleshooted every single setting in the BIOS, I'm sure I could get this a bit better. Uh, but right now, undervolting the CPU seems to be uh, doing well for the temps because if I just left the V core at auto and uh, kept the frequency the same, temps got into the low 80s. So this seems to be better. Um, it's it's not perfect. It still does stutter every now and then, but this is definitely a better playing experience than uh, the previous test. All right, and what we're doing here is running Ashes of the Singularity. This is the GPU-focused benchmark. And look, frame rates aren't that great. This is the low preset in 1080p, uh, but it is possible to play this game with compromises. I would say that the frame rates aren't exactly terrible for this type of game. I wouldn't want 30 FPS in a first-person shooter, uh, but for, for this kind of game, it's, it's okay. Um, yeah, look, just trying out different games here. The whole point is it's stable, and if we're willing to make some compromises, you can game on this machine. A 2400G is not a great substitute for a discrete card, but it will keep up with something like a GTX 1050 or 1050 Ti. All right, so here's what I did to get this system stable and running totally passive. Um, I have a negative 0.125 volt offset for vCore. I also have a negative 0.1 offset for the IGP and the frequencies for the CPU, 3400 megahertz across all four cores, and for the GPU, 1040 megahertz. When stressing both the CPU, FPU cache, and GPU in IDA64 Engineer, temperatures reached about 78 degrees Celsius after a 30 minute run, and that remained unchanged for the next 30 minutes, so at an hour point, uh, they were basically flatlined, which tells me that the CPU heat sink here, this Heligon 2 was heat soaked, uh, and it was actually able to dissipate enough heat to keep temperatures from rising anymore, which is really cool. I, ne I didn't honestly think this was going to work as well as it did. I thought I'd have to keep clocks around 2.8, 2.9 gigahertz, but 3.4 gigahertz is pretty good for a, a four core chip like this with an IGP, with Vega graphics baked in. Now I have the sound meter here, but there's really nothing to show you. It sounds like ambient because there's no moving parts in this thing. Uh, it is totally silent. There's there's no detectable noise coming from anything. I don't even hear coil whine. And uh, yeah, that's because there are no moving parts. And that is something that I've kind of always wanted to do. I just, I didn't really see it being very practical for my use cases. Uh, a lot of this stuff is more niche. It's, it's not general consumer stuff. Fanless tech is, it's, you know, it, it's just not as mainstream, I guess I should say. And there's a reason for that. You do have to make some compromises. Yeah, you could spend a bunch of money, buy some really intricate cases and really crazy coolers. Maybe your entire case is like one big heat sink. You could do a lot of that stuff, I'm sure, but those components, the hardware required is a lot less accessible to the average consumer, either because it's just rare and they don't make many of those products or because it's pretty expensive. Either way, it's not something I would recommend to the general consumer unless you just absolutely want a dead silent PC that makes no noise at all. I've had dead silent laptops, laptops with no moving parts, including no fans. Uh, my original MacBook, uh, it was just the regular MacBook, the 12 inch one, had no fans, solid state storage. So um, that was cool, but 
you know, it got really hot to the touch. Laptops in that form factor generally do, especially under load. Uh, so there were some trade-offs there. Would I have included a fan? Personally, yeah, I would have. I, I can put up with a little bit of sound to get the system to run cooler overall, maybe get a little more overclocking headroom if you're going for that sort of thing. Uh, but the practicality of this just isn't there for the for the general consumer again. I'm stressing general consumer enthusiasts who want this, who want to build something even better than this. I know it's possible. Uh, that is certainly an option though. And that's the cool thing, knowing that you could do this if you wanted. If I bought a 1050 or a 1050 Ti palette or whatever manufacturer produces fanless 1050 Ti's, then uh, I could do that. I could put that in here and the system would be much more powerful than it is. But you can see here in our 3D Mark Time Spy results that this system is not far off from a stock 2400G with a fan included. So yeah, there's, there's that. You're only losing about maybe 20% of total CPU overhead by running it fanless. And that's just the result of this particular case I went with. If I had it in an open air test bench, maybe it would have fared a bit better. But in a case like this, which I think is actually pretty nice. It's a nice case from Silverstone. I'll link it down below. Uh, I think that the results were to be expected, but still decent. And if you were willing to get by with running games on medium to low settings in 1080p or 720p, then this could certainly work. With that, if you guys like the video, let me know if you give someone a thumbs up. I appreciate it. Thanks to Silverstone for sending out this stuff. And uh, yeah, I've got more Ryzen benchmarking to do. So back to the old grind. Stay tuned a couple more days and all will be revealed. This is Science Studio. Thanks for watching again. And thanks for learning with us.